Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Georgetown Center's Little Nuggets of Tech and Telecom with Carolyn Brandon and Jen Fritchie. Hi, Jen. How are Hi, you? Hi, Carolyn. How are you? I'm well. I'm very excited about our backgrounds. I feel like we've leveled up. So if anybody <laughs> cares uh, to give us their opinion about our very fancy uh, backgrounds here featuring our esteemed logo, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So please put a comment, thumbs up, thumbs down, or if you don't care, uh, don't bother in the chat. <laughs> so we are very, 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 very happy to feature our guest, uh, Mr. Doug Break this month. Thank you, Doug, for joining us. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I mean, it's great to be here. Uh, looking through the, the backlog of these programs that you all done, it's a real who's who in uh, telecom. So Glad to join the ranks of uh, guests on. on <laughs> well the deserved, Doug. You deserve yeah. a seat here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let the audience in on um, not only we would be happy to feature you at any time, I just know that you've been very, very busy in other pursuits before landing in your current role at CTIA. So just give us a thumbnail as to the path that you've been leading to find yourself here at CTIA. Sure, yeah. I um, out of trained as a lawyer. I've never really truly practiced law, but uh, I was trained as a lawyer at uh, University of Colorado out in Boulder. I uh, went there with a big interest in technology policy. Um, and some of the folks there, you know, Dale Hatfield, Phil Weiser, Pierre DeBreeze really, um, you know, gave me the bug for, for spectrum policy. Um, then went from there after I graduated, uh, I worked for a think tank, the Information Technology Innovation Foundation. Uh, for man, it went so fast. It was about about seven years I was there uh, working with Rob Atkinson and the great team over there. I really learned a lot. Um, and then I uh, did a short stint uh, over at NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, joined the government, had, you know, to be honest, planned to be there a little longer than I had, uh, but ended up being there for about a year. And then this position at CTIA opened up um, and it felt like a, a great fit. It's a, it's a really great team. So so yeah, that's uh, that's how I how I came to be here. Yeah, working on the policy and communications team. So working on you know developing reports, uh, you know, with outside consultants as well as internally, and you know, really digging into some of the research and policy questions facing the wireless industry. So Doug, um, just obviously Spectrum and all things Spectrum, critically important to your members and to you as an organization. But before we delve into that, which we certainly will, first I wanted to get a sense other than Spectrum related issues. So access to Spectrum, Spectrum planning, Spectrum pipeline, what other issues are facing the industry right now for 2023 that you're working on in terms of either research or data gathering, et cetera? Sure, yeah, no, it's, it's, funny, it's funny the way to frame for a question that, because like on our research agenda, it's like spectrum is issues one through 10. And then, you know, of course there are a lot of other important things, but, but spectrum really is the main focus. Um, what comes to mind immediately, um, other than Spectrum, uh, there are a lot of important questions around uh, some of the support mechanisms for uh, subsidies for broadband. Uh, I'm thinking in particular, uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program, the ACP program. There's a real concern, I mean, uh, maybe not quite immediate, but in coming years, the funding for that program uh, is eventually going to run out. Uh, it's been a really successful, important program uh, providing subsidies to low-income users through the pandemic, um, providing you know, a, a substantial subsidy for connection as well as for devices. Um, so really important program, um, but there's not you know, an ongoing source of funding other than the, the one-time appropriation. Um, for funding may run out somewhere in 2022. So that's something we're studying, thinking about um, you know, how do we um, how do we best support that program? That runs, you know, tandem with the Universal Service Fund um, that likewise has some pretty, you know, shaky foundations in terms of its funding. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's a whole whole big can of worms, but uh, something that, uh, you know, a lot of people have been thinking about for a long time uh, has, the, the can has been continuously kicked down the road. Um, and so with both of these programs kind of on, on shaky financial ground. I think it's really time for, you know, a, a serious policy conversation, bring a lot of folks together to figure out how to, how to put those programs on a real, um, you know, sustainable uh, uh, long-term path. 
uh, that uh, has a funding mechanism that makes sense, right? That isn't a you know regressive, uh, you know, essentially regressive tax on uh, on consumers of broadband or, um, or or by other means, you know, looking at how we might consider broadening the base uh, for that program. Um, of course, you know, net neutrality. Uh, you know, may come back into the conversation. Uh, so that's sort of one of the, you know, perennial policy issues that, that we're always thinking about. Um, uh, you know, we'll see if that, if that becomes uh, an issue again. It feels like, um, you know, given where the, the law has been and there have been no real serious issues, I'm not sure that it's something that the FCC will want to revisit. Um, uh, uh, it doesn't seem necessary, but but like I said, it has a way of kind of creeping back into the conversation again and again. So always something we're considering. But yeah, those are a couple of the top issues <laughs> other than spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we get to spectrum there. I mean, it's obviously kind of the elephant in the room here, and just a um, lot of debate. I think the C CTI has been very vocal about the need for more mid-band spectrum. Is the U.S. still even with C band and 345 auction are still lagging many of our counterparts. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about the good work you guys are doing on that front. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, Mid-band spectrum uh, is is really, uh, really critical. Um, uh, it, it has, right, the, the properties, uh, you know, sitting in between low band spectrum. And uh, I know you all know this, I'm sure many of your viewers know this well, but but right, mid-band spectrum right shares some of the, the, the characteristics of low band and that it has you know, great coverage, great propagation, is easy um, to, to move through, through buildings or foliage, things like that. Um, while it also, um, not only is there, there uh, opportunities for uh, significant uh, chunks of bandwidth in, in mid-band that gives us greater speeds, greater capacity, um, but it also can take advantage of some of the recent innovations in antenna technology uh, to really leverage uh, advances in technology to give us real throughput. So mid-band is really, uh, really critical. Um, and you're right that, that the U.S. Is, is lacking compared to some of our, um, our peer, uh, peer nations. We've done research uh, looking at uh, a number of different countries um, and, and showing that the U.S. Is, uh, is considerably behind, particularly behind China, which is a, which is a real concern. You know. So to that point, um, could you give us a few, a, a deeper sense as to why we should care relative to where the U.S. is versus China? I mean, obviously, those of us who are close to the issue understand that, but I think folks who are a little bit more removed are, you know, very focused on what's happening here in the U.S. and don't really understand why us being behind China in terms of being able to influence the designation of standards and design of equipment and then ultimately building that. Um, why that's a why that could be harmful to the U.S. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the competitiveness and you know keeping pace with China, huge issue, hugely important. Also, right, incredibly complicated. Um, I and I worry that sometimes uh, people can can look at some of the stats and figures out there and start to panic. Right. I don't think that that there there's grounds for panic when it comes to you know our. Our competitive race with with China and, and 5G. We're doing really well in the U.S. when it comes to, um, particularly when it comes to investment. Right, we're about four four and a half times uh, more investment than China uh, when it comes to deploying uh, 5G, uh, and that is also you know helps explain. Uh, uh, according to Ookla, right, we lead in terms of 5G availability. When you have a 5G device and you're trying to connect to a network, uh, U.S. leads in terms of your ability to find a 5G network. So there's no reason to panic, but but you're right that again this this comes back to spectrum, right? China has already signed nearly twice the midband compared to the United States to license spectrum for wireless operators, um, and uh, you know that includes key parts of lower three and four gigahertz band that you know folks are talking about here in the U.S. Uh, but China's also considering making the entire six gigahertz band available for commercial wireless operations. Um, so I'm like. United States, where we, you know, allocated that to, to unlicensed uh, six gigahertz band. So together, you know, assuming they go through with the six gigahertz, which I think they're still still studying, still considering, but that would make for you know over uh, 1,600 megahertz of you know key 5G midband spectrum available in China. It would be over six times the amount of midband 
that's available for wireless operators today. Um, and so they're really doubling down on this question of mid-band spectrum, really trying to make that available. Um, and that's really what sees, especially in the longer term, uh, uh, mid-band is what can best be leveraged for this kind of sort of next generation of applications that are coming down the pipe. We've seen a lot of exciting initial applications around 5G, but you know it's not a monolith. There are still new aspects of, aspects of the technology that are being deployed um, that will really be able to leverage that, um, that mid-band spectrum. When it, when it comes to applications, if it's worth getting into, um, you know, China is really focused on leveraging 5G for digital transformation, especially for manufacturing. They put out in September a five-year plan uh, 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 to incorporate 5G into, uh, into their manufacturing processes. And of course, they have a very different system than, than in the US, right? It's not a sort of bottom-up entrepreneurship. They have you know, very, very discrete plans, uh, you know, specific coordination between local authorities uh, and different manufacturing bodies really looking to leverage this technology. So it's like, we don't need to follow all of those steps, but I think it's really alarming that uh, the amount of spectrum that they're dedicating to these sorts of resources, um, especially considering the US, it's like, we have some bands we're talking about, but we don't have a firm pipeline in place. We don't have any auctions planned. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat alarming. We, we really need to, uh, to catch up, yep. And Doug, you you made the point. I think four, four, we've we in the U.S. have invested more than China in, in 5G. I think you said 4.5 times. Is the carrier's argument to those who will listen that um, with more spectrum that that investment gets more effective? Is that you just need more? I always describe it as lanes on the highway. Um, and it, I think the capex strains if we don't get more spectrum will be very real because their balance sheets have to be considered. Mm -hmm. No, that's absolutely right. There's, I feel like there's this notion out there that right, you can either, you know, build more infrastructure or deploy more spectrum. And of course, right. the answer has always been both, mm -hmm. but it's overwhelmingly more effective to allocate more, uh, more spectrum to these networks to be able to free up more capacity. There are real limitations when it comes to deploying more infrastructure. How how far that will take us, right? Um, we've got, you know, you know what is it, over 90, 95% of the population covered with macro networks already. And yeah. so the investment to put in small cells and you know, fill in uh, smaller areas of particularly high demand gets very expensive uh, very quickly, right? And so uh, it's clear that, that, uh, that allocating more spectrum is a much more effective way to see real gains in, uh, in capacity. There's always the hope, right, of real breakthroughs in spectral efficiency. Um, and historically, US operators have been really good on this front. Our research has indicated that during the 4G decade, uh, spectral efficiency increased uh, 42 times over. Um, so we're, 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 you know, getting more capacity for a given block of spectrum. But at the same time, that runs into real limitations, right? There are hard, you know, theoretical mathematical limitations to how much efficiency we can gain out of a given a given block of spectrum. Um, and so we can't really expect that to continue increasing forever. Um, you know, it's, of course, it's like all of those things we need to keep pushing on. But the real answer to, to get real more real capacity um, is from is from additional spectrum. So um, I want to follow up on, on, on two things, back. Doug, that you mentioned. Um, one is, it's interesting that I, you you very much obviously and accurately describe the the tension, right? So there is the camp that thinks all you need is spectrum, and then the camp that thinks all you need is equipment. And what has always been curious about the folks who say, "Oh, you don't need to give them more spec or access." I mean, let's be clear: there's no giving here, right? The, this is making available the opportunity to pay a load of money or an asset that you are then expected under a certain time period to invest and build out and show actual, uh, you know, actually produce an output. So is this idea that, you know, simultaneous with the entire globe thinking about greening and the environment, we have this cohort, which tend to be progressives and consumer advocates in the United States, who are pushing the industry to just put more infrastructure in, i.e. just hang more stuff, more equipment, which 
seems to fly in the face of you know what they're saying in terms of the environment so it's it's always been confusing and i guess that ultimately is a question it's more of a commentary sorry my uh question i actually have one is you were talking about coordination in china and i know one thing we haven't talked about yet is this debacle if you will between the fcc and ntia and faa and by debacle i mean from the consumer perspective from the network operators who were expecting to be able to light up some systems to improve capacity and coverage, haven't been able to do so in some places. What can we learn, or is there anything to be learned from the closer coordination we see happening in China in terms of how we can at least get our agencies to work more closely together and on a more timely basis so we don't end up with this crazy situation we've been running into over the last two years on the C-band stuff? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a good question and and definitely a um, an important and <laughs> ongoing conversation, right? I think you're absolutely right that that it comes back to coordination um, and making sure that you know everyone uh, is involved in these sort of uh, or at least aware, right, of these policy mechanisms moving forward. Um, at the end of the day, so so many of uh, these issues around. Uh, reallocating spectrum, they're achievable, right? It's like these are hard, difficult problems by identifying bands, um, you know, looking at the systems that, that incumbents are using in that band, often government users. Um, like, I mean, C-band is a great example, right? Looking at those altimeters that are in use today, um, it, and it's not always easy to get your arms around what's out there, who's using what, how expensive, how difficult, what the time frame is to make that transition, but it's doable, right? It's it's a difficult problem, but if we've got everyone, you know, growing in the same direction and working together to make those uh, make those transition happen, uh, it, it, it's really it's really achievable. So I think you know C band uh, is like if if some of the conversations that we ended up having, um, you know, much <laughs> much too late in the process had happened a lot earlier. Uh, we could have identified, you know, uh, to what extent there are, uh, you know, altimeters that really need to be upgraded. Uh, you know, perhaps there are some, you know, old helicopters that, you know, if they're flying right next to a base station, maybe they need a new altimeter. But that's something that we can solve, right? That we as a nation can come together and fix that problem. Uh, this this uh, issue of coming in, you know, late in proceeding and um, uh, and and uh, and then, you know, having a a bunch of problems, you know, late in the uh, in the process, you know, after operators had already paid a significant amount, not just for the spectrum, but also for accelerated clearing of the spectrum to get to get quicker access. Right? It's a real it's a real problem, but um, but yeah, I'm hopeful that uh, you know moving forward, there th this issue got so much attention that I think there's a lot of awareness that for uh, you know future repurposing efforts. As long as we have, you know, folks in the room and working together um, uh, towards the same goal, that that we can avoid those sorts of uh, those sorts of uh, debacles, as you put it, uh, going forward. Yeah, I would hope. And it's just so amazing because it's not like this stuff isn't deployed around the world. And you know, we we hear of terribly tragic events, but none of them because of you know five G. Um, Jen, I didn't want to cut you off. I see you have a question. No, I was just, I was interested, um, you know, you, in your seat, Doug, and your partners at CTIN, you see so many kind of what the future of 5G looks like. What are some cool applications that you think we're about to see? I mean, it's always pointed out that with 4G, you know, it was built it and then Uber arrived, you know, so there's models we don't even know that yet will exist, but curious as to your view there. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I get really excited personally about like the the applications and, and what's coming down the pipe. Um, there are other, to be honest, there are others at CTI who know the know these use cases and these uh, you know the the real specifics of of what individual companies are developing much better than I do. Um, but I get excited, uh, especially around augmented reality. I think is a really exciting application. Um, it's one of those where you know, the idea obviously has been around for years and it's like we have experience with VR, but you're tethered to a computer, right? Uh, um, so it's like the idea has been out there, but there are ways in which, you know, sort of stuff that's still coming down the pipe with 5G 
especially if we get access to, to additional mid-band spectrum, you'll have the capacity to be able to do really data intensive uh, aspects for augmented reality in the cloud mm -hmm. and then have it streamed to a very you know, sleek, slender device on the, on the user side um, to be able to you know, just walk around with glasses and have information streamed in uh, in real time based on what you're looking at. Um, I think could potentially be, you know, a real, um, to, to have that done well, you know, at a really, you know, short delay, really low latency for the whole system uh, would be a really dramatic, um, you know, improvement in the types of, of augmented reality that we see today. So I, I don't know, that's one that, that I get really excited about. Um, there's obviously so much that's like great, you know, for consumers, but also for enterprises, right? The, the opportunity to have like, if you're going in to do, I don't know, repairs on some, some sort of factory line, to have all the information that a technician needs available, you know, in real time as they're looking at different parts of a, you know, complicated system. Um, and safety, right? I know that's not, it's not sexy, but huge improvements to safety. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know, that's, that's one that I really like. Um, I feel like, I don't know, it's like, there's the stuff that's still coming down the pipe. And I feel like 5G is different than 4G in the sense that some of the most exciting stuff, it really requires a lot of research and development yeah. on the application developer side, right? Mm -hmm. With 4G, it's like, you know, we got the app stores, all of a sudden you had, you know, things coming together on the device, GPS and um, in like real, you know, pretty easy mechanisms to monetize those sorts of things. And for consumers um, and to use. This, this quick flourishing of, of applications. Whereas with 5G, it's like so much of the real advanced exotic stuff that really can take, take advantage of what 5G enables, the real low latency, the reliable connection, the extremely high throughput. Um, I feel like that stuff is still, you know, still under development, still coming down the pipe. Um, that sort of means like there are early applications, especially I feel like fixed wireless um, access is like the big one that, I mean, I think is starting to get a lot of attention, um, but I feel like is a, a story of, a, of an early use case that, um, that I feel like is, is somewhat underappreciated. You know, virtually all of the new broadband ads last year were through fixed wireless access, right? Um, taking real market share from uh, you know, cable incumbents in the in the home broadband space. So it, that's a really exciting story. Um, but but yeah, I mean, obviously there's there's a lot going on with with five G use cases that um, and like I said, it's like there are others there are others here who are like that's all they do is studying what's what's going on, what's going down the pipe. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff. Hey Jen, can I turn this, oh, can sure. I turn this around on you and just sure. ask you know from an investor slash street perspective. What are you guys hearing about uh, in that that's exciting that that you think creates new potential for growth, uh, new market segments, something like that? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, I feel like for the people I speak to, it's like at and in one camp where I think they think of 5G as more enterprise related, whereas Verizon and probably T-Mobile think of it as more consumer related. And I was going to do a call out to um, John Travolta at the Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite growing up following the Sandy and Danny story on Greece. But um, I think that the uh, fixed wireless access definitely, although I would say, I, you know, I think that there's definitely a divided camp. If fiber is better, fiber is the future, is fiber always preferred? Um, you know, but I think I think that's a, a healthy debate. You can kind of lay it out on both sides. But I also think that for 5G, I think it's probably more on the kind of what you described what's happening in China is how 5G can really be implemented to the enterprise sector to make mm -hmm. these companies all the more efficient. So let me talk real quick, um, or actually ask you a question, not talk. Um, FCC auction authority, you know, for those of us inside the Beltway, we get it. And those of us sitting in Chicago who work with people inside the Beltway understand all of this, but can you just, you know, a couple minutes, a couple minutes or a couple points on, you know, what, what is it that's expiring and why should we care? Sure. Yeah. FCC auction authority. I mean, this has been like the focus or it's like kind of the catalyst for a lot of the conversations around, around spectrum. Um, here recently. So obviously FCC's auction authority, it's their authority to auction spectrum. 
um, uh, since it was established over 30 years ago, it's never lapsed, which kind of gives you a sense of the importance um, of, of, uh, of you know, maintaining this, uh, this auction authority. Um, yeah, I mean, the, this moment around the conversation around legislation for the OCC's auction authority is extremely important. I mean, for, for a number of different reasons, right? I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a clear opportunity to clarify our nation's agenda and priorities around spectrum and establish a pipeline. Um, often this is, you know, where we have a conversation to, to establish a clear, you know, list of bands that, that Congress is, is kind of directing FCC and others to, uh, to, to allocate, usually to allocate to, to uh, mobile broadband is, um, so that's the, the highest demand. Um, yeah, so, so a, a clear opportunity to, you know, establish a pipeline for Spectrum, which is critical, um, but just the auction authority in itself is incredibly important. I mean, I mean, I think one of the most important things is the way in which it sends a signal internationally of the priority on which the the U.S. Uh, the the priority on which the U.S. puts auctioning Spectrum for flexible mobile use. Um, we have, you know, later this year the the World Radio Conference at the ITU, um, and I don't know that that is, you know, uh, it's whole other a whole other you know separate complicated conversation around international spectrum. But to have the U.S., you know, not just clearly identify bands, but also clearly prioritize auctioning spectrum um, uh, going into those conversations is, is absolutely critical. Um, it's also, I mean, <laughs> clearly, right, it feeds into all of our earlier conversation around China and competitiveness to be able to really, um, you know, clearly establish a, a framework and priority bands uh, for how we're going to navigate this uh, what right now is kind of an uncertain time where we don't have uh, a clear pipeline um, to be able to, to do that, put those bands on the table um, and, and tell the FCC, you know, go to it, uh, uh, I think is, is really important. Yeah. And I, um, I was thinking, gosh, it's been around that long, uh, the FCC's auction authority. And it reminds me that um, back when I was, I think I was still in law school, um, you know, was part of that as I was doing the little, the, doing the research as a little um, intern up on the Hill. And I think what people uh, much younger than I who are involved in that discussion today forget is why they chose auction. It was, you know, it came from a consideration of lots of other ways of allocating spectrum from literally the balls in the lottery system where they would pop up a number. And if you had that number, you got a, you got a license. I mean, no, no kidding. Mm -hmm. And then they had what are called beauty contests, right? So everybody would go in and try to outdo the other with their, with their um, application. So they, ended up because of things that the federal government was doing to get rid of excess properties, if you'll remember the RTC Corporation and others. And they found that auctions were really efficient in terms of it takes the least amount of time to get the resource out there into the hands of people who invested in it and are willing to then put it to good use. It was that simple. It wasn't sort of uniquely to, to Spectrum. So What's frustrating, having been around for a really long time, Doug, and I, I'm heartened that you will be able to make a difference in all of these conversations, is that so many people forget about the history of where these auctions came from. They think it was some sort of made up thing where somehow the incumbents are getting away with something, <laughs> when in fact it was a tool the federal government decided to use because it was efficient and effective. And then, you know, everybody and their brother, if you're qualified, you get to uh, participate, and Ardoff has reminded us when you when the FCC does not have very stringent qualification rules, you end up allocating a resource very inefficiently, i.e., to people who can't use it, can't afford it, have to give it back, have to re-auction it. Really takes time. Could have had stuff out there already. Um, before we end, Doug, what's coming down the pike aside from all of the great papers and? you know, infographics you guys have been putting out on a ton of different issues. I'm wondering, are there any big events, maybe a 5G summit coming up? Uh, anything else that the public should be aware of and have on their calendar? That's right. We've got the, the 5G summit coming up later in the spring, uh, sort of our flagship event. Uh, we're very busy preparing for um, but that. We're going to be taking a look at sort of, I mean, Spectrum is obviously an important component, but the broader 5G economy. Um, uh, framing it kind of like a, a state of the union, right? It's like the mm -hmm. state of the state of wireless um, and pulling back and kind of looking at where we've come, uh, you know, how far we've come in terms of 5G and what is still 
uh, is still coming down the pipe. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, 5G Summit uh, is is our big flagship event that we're we're busy <laughs> busy preparing for, <laughs> among, among a lot of other things going on. But yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. Jen, over to you. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to just summarize what I see as the three big takeaways from all my notes here. One, I'd say CTA is a lot busier than just Spectrum. A lot of other things on your to-do list. Secondly, Spectrum is top of mind for many and continues to remain the lifeblood of all these carrier networks, especially mid-band. And it shouldn't be ignored, the gap, the widening gap the U.S. is facing versus other countries, especially China. And then third and finally, 5G, I'm going to say buckle up. And the R&D element of 5G might make this different than any other G Carolyn and I have lived <laughs> through before. And there's been, I don't know, I remember two Gs. So oh <laughs> there's been there a, was a time there was, were no Gs, if you remember. That's right. <laughs> that was a pre-G time. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. oh Debbie, like me and too long. <laughs> As long as we're not talking about 6G, like, not, right. I'm not there yet. I'm sure, well, Japan's focused already on 7G, right? They're always, <laughs> you know, one or two Gs ahead in terms of what they talk about. Well, listen, that's thank you all to be researching. We're, that's not, not policy. <laughs> Thank you Doug, very, very much for joining us. We really appreciate the time. Congratulations on your newest job. We look forward to following your career as you go on to even bigger and better things. So thank you. Thank you Jen, so much. Thank as you always, so much, great Doug. to see you. I'm hopeful that we'll maybe get the WR, the United States' newest WRC ambassador as our guest for our March uh, gathering. So everyone stay tuned for that announcement. And otherwise, uh, look forward to seeing everyone again in about a month. Perfect. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day.